well, nice to be here. Uh, my name is uh, Martin. I'm from uh, Two Tribes. I'm actually uh, the co-founder. And um, today I want to take you on a trip down memory lane uh, of 17 or 18 years, Two Tribes. Uh, we've done a lot, um, a lot of awesome things and a lot of things that uh, went horribly wrong. And hopefully, I guess you guys are game developers or interested in game development or anything like that. So perhaps some of the things that I'm going to say will make sense to you or perhaps you, you can take some lessons out of it. So, um, what do I want to uh, discuss today? First, the early years. How did we start with two tribes? Um, working from home, launching our first game. Uh, then I want to continue on um, making the decision to take on a real company, uh, work for hire, um, getting personnel, things like that. Uh, then we switched to self-publishing, um, no more work for hire, we moved on to self-publishing and those were for us the best years ever. And then we went bankrupt, <laughs> we um, rebooted the company, uh, we decided to make one more game and then we decided to quit the business altogether. So hopefully it won't be um, a very negative story here, but um, this is what I uh, want to talk to you about. Anyway, let's start with the very beginning. Um, 1991, 1992, uh, a friend of mine, Colin, uh, who I actually started the company with, uh, he, he created a game called Eggbird for the MSX. I'm not sure if anyone here knows MSX. It was a, an old system. I think it was Microsoft and Sony, something like that. But he made uh, Eggbird in his uh, free time when he was still in high school. And it's a, it's a cute little game about a, a chicken that needs to collect eggs. And you know, as you can see, it's uh, very old school. And um, this uh, was us in the uh, end of the 90s. So Colin made that game for the MSX. And in 1998, there was a... Um, uh, the Game Boy Color came out, and so we wanted to see if we could make a game for the Game Boy Color. That would be kind of cool. And um, so we tried to, um, to, to do some development on there, but it was pretty difficult, because if you're just a couple of guys working from home, how can you start making a game for a system like the, the Game Boy Color? Uh, in those days, it was not really uh, possible to, to buy an engine or to license an engine and just start developing. It was just not possible. But there was a, a homebrew scene back then, um, so people were actively trying to figure out what is actually happening on the Game Boy Color, how could you make it work, how could you put a sprite on the screen, how could you make audio. So there were online you could find all kinds of sources to, uh, to, to figure that out. And there was a, a, a Korean, a South Korean a website called Licksang, and you could actually buy one of those things that I, I'm displaying here. It's called a, um, um, a flashcard burner, and so you could hook it up to your PC. As you can see, it's a very old school style connector. And basically, you could write code on your PC and test it on. Uh, you could flash it on that thing, and then you could test it in your Game Boy to see if it actually was working. So this is how we, uh, how we started uh, our development. And it was actually pretty difficult to, um, to, get to be a real developer because uh, Nintendo had these restrictions. They said, uh, you can be a developer, but you need to have a track record. And to, in order to have a track record, <laughs> you needed to be a developer, of course. So there was this chicken egg story there already. So we couldn't be a developer because we weren't a developer. So we decided to do it this way. Um, but the original plan was to make a shooter like, uh, like Gradius, because we, we love to play Gradius uh, type of games. I'm not sure if anyone knows Gradius here. It's, a, it's an old school shooter from the 90s. It was, uh, it was really cool. But we also already saw that making a completely new game would be difficult, so we decided to see if we could take on that project that Colin made in his early days uh, called Eggbird, because the design was already there, so we wanted to make uh, Eggbird for uh, the Game Boy Color. And we did. Uh, we spent uh, two years on, on that game, even though we thought it was much easier because we already had the design. It turned out to be much more difficult and um, so we, we spent two years of our time uh, making, on, uh, making that game. And then, um, yeah, this is a, a nice guy called Paul Bregel. Um, we had this game, it was all cool, but how can you sell the game? We were from the Netherlands, we had no experience in the video game industry, so how on earth could we sell it? And by chance, we, we met this guy on ICQ. Uh, this is an older picture of him, obviously. He is, uh, uh, he is, he is my age now. Um, so he is, this is recent, uh, a recent photo. Um, but he had his, a video game company called Paragon 5. 
Uh, he was based in Poland and in Chicago back then. And he is the type of guy you need to meet because he knows a lot of people and he was really into the, the video game industry. He had his own uh, video game company as well. So he said, look guys, what you have made is an awesome game. I'm going to take it with me and I'm gonna, uh, going to the E3, which is this huge uh, video game uh, uh, venue, of obviously, in, uh, in L.A. And he wanted to pitch our game alongside with his own games to, uh, to some companies in um, on E3, and he did that, and um, it was pretty cool because there were very big players like Capcom and Konami, they both wanted uh, our game, um, Egbert, so we had, we had a choice. Konami actually said, well, we, we like your game so much, but we don't like the character so much, so we want to tie in some other character, and they actually named uh, Calimero, perhaps some people know that it's an old... Um, I think it was a, a cart cartoon from the 80s or something like that. So they wanted to use that uh, IP. And Capcom didn't. And they said, well, we actually like that little chicken or whatever it is. So we want to, uh, to use that one. Uh, only the name uh, needs to change because there was already an IP um, called Eggbird in the US. So they said, we need to change that. And eventually we settled on, uh, on the no name uh, Tokitori. And um, well, they, they released it. Uh, under the name Tokitori, but it, for us it was um, the whole thing from uh, from back then. It was just as as if some people were pranking us, because we only had um, um, how do you say uh, communications through uh, email or ICQ. We actually never called someone, and we got contracts from Capcom, and they said uh, all kinds of you know very uh, uh, interesting legal terms that we've never heard of. And they were, uh, and they, and then they had like uh, amounts of money that were pretty interesting. And we thought somebody is pranking us. Like friends of us, they will just uh, come out and say, "Look, guys, this is all a big hoax. This, this is not true." But it was true. So we actually got, you know, this game was released, and this is a pretty old picture uh, of me and uh, and my business partner Colin, a long time ago, and uh, it was released um, uh, in 2001. So basically. This was the start of Two Tribes. Uh, this is actually an old logo that we never used. <laughs> it's pretty awesome, right? Yeah. I like this more than the, the one that we had later, but uh, this was a little bit more... Um, I think people yeah, would like this one better. But <laughs> so, so this was the start of uh, Two Tribes, the, the birth of Two Tribes, so to say. And uh, basically we thought, well, now we, we made one game, we, we can do this again, right? So we started with, uh, with, an, with another game, Three Tribes, well, interesting name, obviously. And uh, here you have a, a little video of what it is. We actually never released this. Oh, I had, uh, the audio is a little bit uh, soft. So we worked for on this game for two years, just me and Colin. Uh, we actually rented a small um, like place uh, with a friend of us. He had a, a big company and he had one room to spare so we could use that room. And now we were able to, uh, to do official development because we, we called Nintendo and we said, look, we, we made a game, uh, we released it, and they actually tried to track down our developer license and they couldn't find it. And then they said, how did you even re release a game on, uh, on Game of Color before? So we explained all that and then all of a sudden we, we were able to make use of the official development kits, which was pretty awesome. Um, so we made this game two years uh, and we pitched it to Nintendo because we thought, well, if this is a game to uh, uh, someone would like, it would probably be a Nintendo. And um, so we went all the way to uh, to Frankfurt. There they have um, uh, Nintendo of Europe is based there. So we went there and uh, we pitched the game, and they totally liked it. And um, but in order for Nintendo to publish games, uh, you need to go through a lot of you know steps. And they also contacted Japan. And unfortunately, Japan didn't like it, or they had different plans. Uh, so inexperienced as we were, we decided to just, well, then it's not, a, not, not this project, so we just canceled it. So it's never released. We didn't take on, uh, we didn't even try different publishers. So it's, looking back, it was kind of, kind of stupid. I mean, we've, we've worked for two years on the game, we pitched it to one publisher, they said no, and we said, okay, then it's probably not good, and let's just move on. I don't know how we, uh, how we got there, but it was just uh, one of those mistakes. So we went to the very interesting uh, business of making some websites and flash games and all that kind of stuff. And it was back then that I decided to, 
to take on my graduation project. Uh, so I moved away from Two Tribes for, for one year, and I just um, worked site where, site, um, on the site a little bit. But during that time, uh, Paul, you know, the guy with the big beard, uh, he contacted um, Nokia, and they had this um, awesome phone. Perhaps some, somebody of you still remember this one, the Nokia Engage. You needed to hold it sideways to your head. It looks like, it, well, it was very big, of course. So um, they, uh, they contacted us because, Nokia, Nokia uh, contacted us because Paul convinced them that we were uh, having a, a very good team. You know, we, we could make awesome things. He showed them the demo of three types that I just uh, showed you. And um, Nokia and THQ decided to uh, get us a project called Worms World Party. I'm not sure if anyone knows Worms, but I think most of, the, uh, most of you would uh, know it. It's a, it's a game from the 90s. Uh, it's, it looks a little bit like this, very pixelated, but... So, uh, we worked on Worms, um, and me, uh, while being doing the uh, graduation project, and uh, Colin full-time. Uh, so we worked on this project, and this opened a lot of doors when we finally f finished this, because uh, we were talking to Nokia, to THQ, and Team17 on the side ways as well. Team17 is the original creator of Worms. So, this was cool. Um, I decided to, to go back to, uh, to my own company um, and said, well, look, if we're going for this, for this game company, we better professionalize it. Uh, we need to change things. We cannot just work for two years on the game, pitch it to one publisher and say, bye, uh, that's just crazy. So I, I got back to the company and said, okay, we need to professionalize it, we need to hire uh, personnel and take on projects. So uh, we tried. This is another game that we never released, unfortunately. Uh, we worked together with Team17 on this one and THQ. We wanted to make a game called uh, Worms World Conquest. It was also for the Nokia Engage, but unfortunately uh, the platform kind of failed, so the project was cancelled. It was a mix between Advance Wars, I don't know if you know it, but Advance Wars and Worms, so it would be kind of cool. Uh, meanwhile, we were trying to see if we could make a Tokitori 2. This was uh, early 2005, so we made some several, uh, you know, concept things. It never took off, actually, but... Uh, um, and we did, because we n uh, now knew uh, Nokia. They basically <laughs> said, look, uh, we, can, we want to have some golf games on our, on our mobile phones, so we did uh, a couple of those. Um, and we worked on the Nintendo DS, because the Nintendo DS was just released. We wanted to make something cool for, for the Nintendo DS. So uh, um, this is um, a prototype, just box shot of, um, of Rewind, which later turned into our last game, which is Rive. It's like a space shooter. And back then, we, we always wanted to make a game, uh, an Unreal shooter, because we played a lot of Time Crisis and House of the Dead in those traditional arcades. So we wanted to make a game like that. Um, but it was just a pitch and it never took off. This actually was our, um, yeah, it looks horribly <laughs> bad, but um, back in the day uh, we got contacted by another company um, that was an acquaintance of Team 17 and they asked us to pitch for Cartoon Network. Uh, they wanted to have a kart racing game. And we, we, we'd love to make a, um, a racing game, so this was an opportunity, so we actually went uh, you know, making in a, in a week time or something like that. We made something like this. Uh, it doesn't look good, but you have to remember it was just us making everything from scratch, that there were no engines that we could use, and we only had one week to create something. And you could actually ride along that route a little bit, and it looks pretty cool. And they liked it, but unfortunately they said to another company they were probably much cheaper, and they said they can have it. So that was kind of shitty. Um, but later, because we still knew that the publisher, they said, well, we, we do have this other project called Gar Garfield. Can you pitch for that? So we were, yeah, you know, race game is much better than a lazy fat cat. How can you make a game out of that? Um, but we, we got to work with that and we actually had a pretty nice idea and we pitched for it. And um, so they said, sure, it, all was fine. And they agreed on the, on the money and, and then they said, Okay, but we want to visit your office. And, um, and we were, I think we had two or three people working for us then, and perhaps an intern. Um, and, and we knew that if they would come over and see just three people working there and an intern, that we would we'd never get that project. So uh, we decided to, uh, to call some friends and some, uh, 
some old interns and everything like that. And th at that day, uh, there was also, we had a Norwegian guy working for us, so we flew him in, so he was there as well. I think in the end of the day, we had 12 people there sitting in the office. Very old computers. So I remember one intern, um, he, had, he used to be a, a music intern at our office. And uh, he, he came over as well, and we gave him the most crappy computer that there was. It was so slow, so he actually had this music program in front of him, and if he moved the mouse, everything crashed, so he couldn't touch the mouse. It was that bad. And then that guy came along um, from, from, uh, from the US, and he um, I was, obviously we picked him up with a very big car from the airport, and uh, we prepared some good lunch for him, so, uh, and a good presentation as well. So he, he came along and he talked to everybody in the office, and uh, including the guy with you know who couldn't touch his uh, his mouse. But actually, he uh, he was very impressed by uh, by by everything that he saw, and I think that attitude back then it was a little bit you know, like boiler room style. But because we knew that we could do it, uh, we had to do something like that because otherwise we we would never been selected. So uh, it was kind of interesting, I guess. So this was uh, our for first big project. Unfortunately, there's a lot of unfortunately in this presentation. Um, this project would last like one year, but the, the, the movie maker decided to release the movie in June as, as opposed to September. And they said, look, um, during the development, they said, look, if we, uh, we can cancel it right now, the whole project, so there will, won't be any DS game, or you can come in if you want to, sure. <laughs> no, okay, that's okay. So they uh, decided to um, to move uh, the date to June instead of September, uh, which also had a severe effect on our design choices because we just had to rush it uh, in order to complete it. But that was just you know the big step into uh, uh, in into doing a new game after we released Toki Tori. No more websites, no more flash games, and. Uh, and on the side, I will just skip through this one fast because we didn't like it back then either. We also did some uh, mobile phone games, which uh, was completely different as it is right now because now you have all these uh, SDKs that are well aligned and all nice and the specs are pretty um, um, the same. Back then we had, I, I, I'm not kidding, we had, at the office we had 1.100 uh, different mobile phones from the US and all kinds of installers that you needed to, to install on your PC. And, upload the build to uh, that device. And some of them had like eight directional controllers and other has only four and you, your game needed to support, ev support everything. It was just horrible. So um, yeah, that wasn't ideal. But we made a bonk um, old game. It was from Hudson, from the, also from the 80s or the 90s, and Monkey Ball Mini Golf from Sega. So they were nice IPs, I guess. Um, but the big one for us was Worms uh, Open Warfare 2. Um, I was a huge fan of Team 17 in the, in the 90s. So uh, when we were contacted to do Worms or Party for the Nokia Engage, I, I was already very happy. And then they, uh, they asked us to work together on uh, like a sequel of Worms Open Warfare, which was a pretty shitty game. And they, uh, they asked us to, to make the DS version of Worms Open Warfare 2. And they were working on the PSP version. And this was, uh, yeah, this was really, really awesome because they, they couldn't do the DS version themselves anymore because they didn't have the original code. They didn't even understand it anymore, but we did. So that was uh, kind of nice. And we had to make uh, a 3D game, uh, build everything from scratch almost. And, uh, and we had like dual, uh, dual screen 3D and online multiplayer with hundreds of leaderboards that Nintendo actually had to come up with new um, lot check requirements to uh, for this specific game. So this was a um, yeah, it was a big game for us. And at that point, we needed to hire a lot of people. Uh, at that point, we had 15 people working for us, so it was pretty big. Um, we did another game that I'm not very proud of, but it was our first um, console game. It was uh, Rubik's Rubik's Puzzle Galaxy. Another very um, short time framed period. We only had like, um, I don't know, nine months to, to make a game for the Nintendo DS and the Wii. Uh, and both had to have like almost 10, 10 mini games per game. So it was crazy. But it was our first console game. And here's a you know, box shelf with a. It's always nice to, 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 to hold a, a CD in your hand or a DVD and think, well, this is what I made. So it was really cool. This is us back then. 
with a, a, a selection of our studio at that moment. The Norwegian guy is over the, uh, over the left, so um, he was still with us back then. Um, but that was also our last project that we did work for hire, because in, I'm now talking about 2008, and we already noticed that um, a lot of publishers that were easy to reach before, were suddenly were kind of harder to reach, or the, the budgets, they instead of asking 300,000 or 400 for a project, we suddenly could only get 60, 70, and you cannot make a game for that kind of uh, money, at least not back then, and especially not with 15 people. So we, um, end of 2008, uh, no, end of 2007, uh, 2008, we, uh, we burned a lot of money because, you know, the income was just um, gone. So we were working on uh, internal projects, uh, like uh, this one is one of our uh, worst games, I guess. It was um, a physics-based concept. It was never released. We actually, I don't even think you can find this on the internet anymore. So that's how proud we are of it. Uh, I think in 2008 there were a lot of physics-based games uh, emerging. Uh, I remember, what's that, oh, Boom Blocks was a very well-known game on, uh, on the Wii. Uh, we thought it was nice to have something that you, you could blow up things and you know, play around with physics uh, things. And obviously there's no animation in, uh, in the guy yet. But. but we were working on the engine because Unity back then was non-existent or it did not exist on the Wii. Uh, in, in any case, we didn't decide to use it uh, at that point. So um, we had uh, to create everything uh, again uh, to, to accommodate what we wanted to do. So we worked on this one, I tried to find a publisher, um, but nobody was interested, so we had to uh, um, exit, unfortunately. And we thought it would be cool to, to do Tokitori again, because it was seven years before, uh, after we released the Game Boy Color version, so we thought, how cool would it be to make our own version of Tokitori for, a, uh, for the emerging, uh, how do you say, the, the, the digital platforms that there were. At that point there was Xbox Live Arcade, and, um, and, and later, WiiWare came along, which is what I'm going to talk about right now. It's chapter three, moving from, um, from doing work for hire to uh, self-publishing. It was not a, uh, like a, a decision that we, um, that we made because we wanted to, but we were kind of forced to, to, uh, into self-publishing because the, uh, the publishers didn't take on any big projects anymore. And we were pretty happy with that because finally we could do what we, uh, we wanted to do ourselves instead of working on another movie IP or anything like that. So um, at that point we also found our publishing uh, company because we thought, well, if we are going to publish our own games and something goes wrong, you know, perhaps it's safe to separate the, the working company with uh, the, the, the publishing company. So if one goes down, the other one stays alive. So this is uh, our first game that we released for WiiWare. WiiWare was, uh, uh, was the digital version of uh, the, the Wii store back then. And um, the Wii was probably one of the most, if not the most popular uh, console ever. So we thought WiiWare would be huge. So we wanted to be part of that and we were fortunate to be uh, part of the launch back then. Um, the difference between Tokitori then and how it was, um, yeah. So, 2009, I'm just going to skip through this uh, quick, uh, a little bit quick now. Uh, 2009, uh, we also launched Tokitori because we thought, well, this is a nice game and uh, WiiWare version did pretty well. So we decided to launch it for the App Store. And instead of self-publishing it, uh, we decided to work with Chilingo because self-publishing sounds nice, but it's not always the best um, solution because there are people that know more about marketing and and publishing than, than just some, some, some young guys that really don't know uh, how to do that properly. Um, they also pre-funded it and they were able to, to promote some of their, the games that they launched earlier to the number one, shot, uh, number one position in America. So uh, we thought, well, this is, uh, this is uh, a good partner to be with. So they launched Tokitori in 2009 on the App Store. And um, uh, around that time, uh, Tokitori was pretty successful for them. It was one of their s most successful games. And I remember that I was contacted a lot by, uh, by the owners of this company back then. And they said, well, they always had some games for me that, uh, that they wanted to put in Tokitori. So they came up with uh, a mini-gore. It was like a shooting game and they, they wanted to put 
uh, the character of Minigore into uh, Tokitori and vice versa. But, you know, a shooting game with, with a puzzle game with a chicken, it doesn't match. So I was kind of uh, fed up with those emails. And at one point, they also contacted me that they had this game with birds that was all very nice. And um, they, um, Tokitori is a bird, so they thought, well, it would be nice to have uh, a bird into uh, Angry Birds, as it turned out to be. It would be very nice to have Tokitori in Angry Birds, and then there could be, you know, an Angry Bird in Tokitori. And I played the game, and I still remember that, and I, I didn't like it at all. So I've, I actually never replied to that email. It was uh, one of my uh, bigger mistakes, uh, I guess, to say, yeah. I still, years later, I, uh, I talked to the, one of the owners of the company, uh, Chilingo, and uh, he always said to me, remember that I sent you that email about Angry Birds? And I said, yes, yes. So yeah, uh, you can make some uh, pretty bad mistakes, but what did I know? So later on, we uh, released Tokitori for Steam. It's just I'll just put this put this on the on the background. So we uh, really, you know, changed the the game as opposed to the Game Boy Color version. So it looks like this right now. But it was not, not just Tokitori, uh, we also worked with Chilingo on, uh, on Ice Age. We actually took the Tokitori engine and, and we could use uh, graphics and assets, uh, other assets from, uh, from the studio, the film studio, and uh, we worked on, 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 on this game, which was really nice. It was, uh, uh, we got paid for it and we got re revenue out of it as well, so it was a very, uh, very good project. Uh, we worked on a, a strange Puzzle game like, um, I'm not sure if you know Choo Choo Rocket, it was a game uh, on the Sega. So we made a kind of a 3D version out of this. Oh, we'll just uh, skip through it fast. Um, but because um, back then Unity was still not as adopted as it is right now, uh, we were in a unique position that we were able to make games for the PC, for the Wii, uh, and for iOS. So we contacted other developers, and this is uh, a game called Edge, it was made by Moby Game, but it was only available on App Store, and we thought, well, this is a, an awesome uh, game that could, could work on, on, for instance, uh, the, the PC. So uh, we contacted him, and we made actually a 3D version of his 2.5D um, version uh, of the game, uh, and released it on, on Steam. And same we did the other way around from, uh, for Swords and Soldiers. We worked on that one. Uh, it was a... PC game and a Wii game, and we brought it to iOS. And I think on iOS, a game like this really worked well. So we, we tried to take on projects that we th thought were very good, uh, games that were very good, but were missing on a certain platform, and we moved them from one to another. Uh, you could call that porting, and we called it uh, converting, uh, optimizing it for, for, the, for the platform. So we did that as well. Uh, in that time, we also changed uh, our office, and we had a, a nice shiny office. It was really nice. Uh, and we worked on this game. Because at that point, there were a lot of 99 cents games. It was just before free-to-play games were uh, um, emerging. So we wanted to be part of, uh, of the whole 99 cents culture. We tried to see if we could you know, make a million bucks out of selling a, a game. So we made this... Uh, match three kind of a game and it was uh, I think really nice we worked on it for for a year and then decided to release it with a big publisher uh, it was online for a month and then we thought things weren't working so well so we decided to pull it and we never released it ever again so another awesome story of uh, things that went wrong um, but around the time we also worked with uh, Valve closely to promote their game uh, Portal 2 um, we were actually able to put parts of Portal 2 inside uh, Tokitori and Rush. If you want to uh, see more information about that, you can find it on, uh, online. It's a really nice uh, read about how multiple developers came together to promote uh, a big game into their games. So it was, uh, it was, uh, it was really nice. So at that point, uh, I don't want to brag, but at that point, I was, uh, we were very happy. We were basically on top of the world, um, and we had money, and we thought, look, all is going well, but we don't want to continue working on other ones' uh, games anymore. Uh, we don't want to do any movie IPs anymore. We just want to do something for ourselves again. And obviously, the, the first thought that came to mind was, again, Tokitori, because that was our big IP. So we wanted to make a real success, and not just a cheap one that uh, has some extra levels or some additional tools, but we wanted to make, you know, um, this is the announcement uh, page. 
Um, we wanted to make something new, so we created uh, Tokitori all from scratch. So we made a completely new engine, and um, yeah, so we wanted to do something original. There is no spoken or written text in the game. Tokitori can only jump or whistle, so uh, he is very limited, but he needs to solve a lot of puzzles. So we worked on that for a long time. Uh, this is a, a shot from the, from the end uh, result. Originally, we wanted to work for nine to 12 months on the game, but that turned out to be two years. Uh, so you probably already know where this is going. Uh, by the end of 2012, I remember I was talking to Colin, uh, which is uh, my, my colleague. Uh, I, I said, look, we need to release this game, but uh, because we were working with 10 people and money was just flowing out, uh, we almost had no money anymore. And, um, and he said, look, uh, he showed me the game back then. I said, we need to release it this month, because otherwise there will be uh, problems. It was December 2012. And uh, we sat down and we played the game, and I said, this is just shit, because I, I, was <laughs> I was a programmer, so I was constantly programming and doing my thing, and we completely forgot about uh, the rest. And so we had to delay it for another three months, and then it was released. But um, yeah, I can show you the end project uh, a little bit. appears to be peaceful. So as you can see, it's like an open world uh, type of game. People compare it to uh, Metroid, Metroidvania type of game. You d really don't know what you can do, but it's, it's your um, mission to find out what you need to do and how to solve the puzzles. So that's what he could do. He could whistle and he could jump. <laughs> so that's it. Yeah, and he could die pretty quickly too. So this game has, I don't know, 26 hours of gameplay and um, I can, um, I will skip it. So uh, a lot of gameplay, but uh, yeah, unfortunately it didn't sell at all. So uh, it was, uh, people didn't understand it or uh, the market was just bad, but it, it resulted in, in us going bankrupt. And uh, I see that I don't have a lot of time anymore, but I will try to skip through this fast then. Um, so ironically, the game that landed us in the business also uh, was our downfall, unfortunately. Uh, we spent over 600,000 euros on the game, and I think to date we, we re recouped half of it, so that's, that's about it. Uh, this is uh, a figure of our income, as you could, of our expenses. So it was always hovering around 30,000, 40,000 euros, and well, that's obviously the place where we went bankrupt, so the expenses were down. I can show you um, uh, how it actually worked with, in terms of sales. Uh, that was the Wii U launch. Um, when we launched the game on the Wii, it wasn't a big spike like that, but it was more, uh, yeah, I don't know, the, the cutoff was, wasn't as sharp. But uh, the even worse was Steam. Um, we had uh, always very good experiences with Steam, but at that point suddenly um, uh, we were out of touch with, uh, with Valve because we spent two years working on a different game, hardly keeping in touch with them anymore, which wasn't a very good thing to do. Um, the Wii U wasn't as popular as we hoped it would be. And in 2013 we already noticed that um, there were a lot of the prices were much lower than they were uh, back in 2011 when we launched the last game. Uh, there were a lot more players because of Unity, there were, so there were many, many uh, more people uh, able to make games, um, which resulted in people not spending so much time anymore uh, on a game. So if it didn't immediately appeal to them, they just, you know, they just went on to another game because, on the, for instance, the humble indie bundle, you can easily uh, get a lot of games for a lot of uh, for cheap price so uh, but it's we also had our own mistakes obviously uh, we we made a puzzle game again they are not that popular anymore um, it looks like a puzzle uh, like a like a kid's game but it isn't uh, we took way too much time making the game and we bet it on a single horse uh, as in 2011 we as you could just see we had a lot of games coming out at the same time so a lot of income and then two years we didn't do anything and then we launched one game and it just went down so uh, so we rebooted, and uh, well, I'm almost giving my uh, um, 
my speech to uh, to uh, my successor Niels. Um, fortunately, we uh, because we went bankrupt, uh, we still had a lot of uh, energy. We didn't want to end with a low, so we thought we we want to make another game. Um, fortunately, we had this separate company that is publishing the game, so that was still generating income. And the other company that um, that had all the employee, uh, employees unfortunately had to go. But we decided to make a new company uh, with only one employee and our two, the two founders. So with that, we made uh, our last game, which is Rive. It's uh, it's uh, based on the rewind concept that we had all the way back in 2005. And we decided to just work one more time on, a, on an awesome game. Um, two and a half years we spent on the game, which is the lo longest development time ever uh, for us, but we were with a sm uh, smaller team. But during the development already we noticed, look, uh, we're getting old. This is, uh, we, we really, we are slow. I mean, there's people with, uh, that, that have experience with Unity or Unreal that can make things like that probably in, in uh, half the time or something like that. Uh, and we noticed that uh, we are not interested in the business anymore as we used to be. I'm not, uh, time's up it says. I'm not into um, the industry anymore I, more as I was before. I'm not into um, wanting to meet that person or that publisher anymore. I'm like, I would just want to make games because I like making games, but not the whole thing around it anymore. So I guess if that's the conclusion of your company, then perhaps you should stop. <laughs> and that's, that's what we did. At least I'm still working on the Switch version, but once that's done, uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to quit as well. So yeah, the future. I know I don't know uh, what's up for me. Uh, my business partner is already traveling the world, and I'm getting awesome pictures uh, back from him. I'm still working on the Switch version, and that will be done hopefully next month, uh, and then uh, we'll see what happens. But um, this was my talk. <laughs> if you want to ask me anything, just let me know.